All right, since you're all quiet, we can get going. <laughs> Um, welcome back to uh, Data Structures. Today is the eighth day of class. Uh, so this weekend was a bit stressful for some people because uh, they had some either trouble providing the homework or they couldn't finish the homework. I'll have some comments on that uh, in a few minutes. Uh, and we are actually, today's big topic is trees. This. Uh, is actually a tree that uh, you can tell it's got like each little branch has like two little things branching off from it. It's kind of neat. The trees we will be talking about are computer science trees, but they're like upside down as if the roots of the tree were at the top and all the little leaves and things were at the bottom. So we'll talk about uh, that. Raise your hand if you've covered trees at all in any other class you've taken. Did Comp 11 talk about trees? Oh, all right, then we're going to be good. You don't understand them? <laughs> no? Well, we'll be all right. We're going to go slow enough that we'll be okay. But we will reintroduce the topic relatively uh, quickly. So here's the schedule. We're going to do Unix tip of the day. Uh, I wasn't going to do an Eclipse tip of the day until I realized that 75% of you failed the memory leak tests that we did when we went for the homework. So if you look to your, let's see, how would we do this? Of the people around you, if there are four people around you, three of you, failed the memory tests that we put in here. Okay, So I, I didn't tell you how to run the memory tests yourself, but I will today. I'll show you how to do it on Eclipse, and I'll show you how to do it on the command line. And uh, it's not hard, but what it means, guys, what it means is that you are, did the mic, the, yeah. What it means is that you are not uh, freeing all of your memory correctly which is uh, not a good idea, right? So we have to actually talk about it. And it probably means that you don't necessarily understand some things about linked lists, like what it means to like, create a node and then delete that node when you're not using it anymore. So we'll do a little bit of that. And, and maybe over the next couple of weeks, we'll talk a little bit more about that. But um, I was a little concerned about the 75% people not doing well on those tests. I haven't figured out how to actually grade that yet. Like, I'm not going to like, oh, you fail, because you all, you know, you didn't get like the memory test. But it's going to be like a small, very small part of the grading, but it will be something. Um, and, uh, and that's that. Now, we'll also talk about late work, introduction to, let me comment on late work right now, too. So some of you got a little bit of a shock Saturday, maybe around 10 or 11 in the morning when you're still trying to provide your homework even though the deadline was Friday night, and I turned off provide. I said, if you're going to provide your homework now, you've got to do it to the late provide. And then I didn't tell you how to do it so that I would get more emails, but like, how do I do the late provide, right? So I could have a little like dialogue about why are you actually late with your assignment, right? Some people ignored that. Like, they just figured it out and said, and I, if, if I haven't heard from you yet, and you did a late provide, right now you've got a zero. And unless I hear from you, you will continue to have a zero on that assignment. So that's my, my policy on late work here. I'll, here's the comments on late work. I don't care if you provide a few hours late. Like if an assignment's due Friday night and you, and you can't get it done and you want to go to bed and you want to wake up in the morning and whatever, just email me and say, hey, Chris, for some reason I couldn't figure out this stupid bug. I hate C++, you know, blah, 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 right? And I'll probably say, OK, you can have until tomorrow night to do it. I, I'm, I'm flexible that way. And if you obviously, if you're sick or if you have some other commitments or whatever, email me before the deadline, not after it's due, and say, oh, yeah, how do I provide late? Sorry, because late is late, right? That's why we have deadlines, right? I mean, it's just a fairness thing, if nothing else, right? I mean, everybody's got to have it due on the same day. And, and if there's an extenuating circumstance, I'm happy to be reasonable. But just email me beforehand, OK? That's, the, uh, that's my like, you know, parent talk. Um, some of you also figured out, hey, look, there's no TAs Friday nights. Sure, I, I have the assignment due Friday night, but if you're waiting until Friday night to do your assignment and like running into CTAs, probably too late, right? The next assignment is due not this Friday, but the next Friday. So you could start on it like now. I've seen some people starting on it already. Get ahead of yourself. Get ahead of the game a little bit, OK? Questions on that? I don't mean to be mean. I really I'm, I, I try to be a nice guy about all this. Um, but just uh, you, you just got to get put your part of the bargain into it in terms of letting me know if something's going to go wrong. Comments, questions? OK, let's go back to the Unix tip of the day. Oh, by the way, we're also going to start introduction to trees. And then um, 
these things called n-ary trees, which is actually kind of a backwards way to start in a lot of classes, and then binary trees. And then I don't think we'll get to sets today, but since we mentioned sets the other day, we'll talk about it. At some point, we'll talk about how sets and trees kind of go together very well. OK? All right, Unix tip of the day. I've talked about this one before with some, some people. There's a number of ways to copy files. You've almost all used the cp command so far to copy files because we give it to you on the lab and say, this is how you get your files from the lab folder into your folder, right? CP. SCP stand, just stands for secure copy. And it's exactly the same, except that it allows you to copy from your, like, from the homework server to your own computer or from your own computer back to the homework server. OK, so that's nice. Going along with both of those is if you don't want to get yourself like mired in the command line details, you can always download a program. My favorite is this one called Cyberduck, mainly because it has the fun, the, the best icon. But um, it's a little like rubber ducky, right? Uh, but, it, but it allows you to actually do drag and drop files from the homework server to your computer and back and forth. So kind of nice in that sense. OK? Yeah. Is there an easy way to do it between a Windows computer and the homework server? Yeah, there's, there's Cyberduck is for Windows too. Yeah, yeah. FileZilla works. There's, um, there's a number of them. Just look for SFTP client or SSH copy client or something like that. It'll, it'll, you'll find them. That, that's the easy way. But let's talk about the CP and the SCP commands for a minute, right? So if I go to the mm, homework server, hang on. There we go. If I go to the homework server and let's say that in my files I've got this, uh, this file called uh, readme.txt.bak, right? And I, wanted to, and I wanted to get it to my own computer, right? What I could do, if I'm on a Mac, it's really easy because you just open up the Mac. If, you're on, um, if you are on a Windows PC, the SCP command, if you don't have a terminal of some sort, it's a little harder. Um, but if you're on a Mac, it's really easy, right? Wherever you want to put the file, you type SCP. Right? And then the file location and name, for instance, cgreg at homework.cs.tufts.edu slash, and this says, oops, sorry, colon. And then that says, hey, I'm now in my home directory. And since this happens to be in a home directory, I'm just going to type it in readme.txt.bak. That's where I'm getting it from. The next thing I'm going to put is where I'm putting it to. And many times we just put a period to say, put it right where I am right now. Right? And so you type all that in. And then normally it'll ask you for your password. And then it will copy it to right there. And if I do a little ls on my Mac now, ls uh, star dot bak, there it is. It's right there, readme.txt.bak, right? If I want to send the file back to the other, like from my computer to the homework server, it's exactly the opposite. SCP, readme.txt.bak, and then cgreg at, cs dot, uh, at homework.cs.tufts.edu, colon, and that will put it right in my home folder if I want it in my home folder. Let's say I want to put it in my temp folder, which I created. I do colon and then temp, right? And then it goes bing, and it puts it right there. Type your password, and then it puts it there. OK, so it's not so bad to actually do the copying back and forth with SCP. Yeah? What's the difference between doing that and doing like the SFTP like on the terminal? Uh, the, SF, the SFTP on the terminal? Yeah. Uh, you could do that, too. Is there a difference? Or? Yeah, this is using a different protocol, different method of copying. But SFTP, I don't even actually remember how to. I haven't done that in so long. But you could. You, could, you can type, I think, to the Linux server, SFTP. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Homework.cs.tufts.edu. And then, uh, yeah, and then it will. And then you can do an LS, and it actually gives your folders, files, and so forth. So it's, it's possible. You just, like, put the yeah, and you put the file there. And so you could, you could do that, too. Any other questions, comments on that one? SCP and then CP is the, the original. You can use CP wherever you use SCP. Or you can use SCP wherever you use CP, rather. They, they, it will work inter file, like on one computer as well. Okay. All right. If you have any questions about that, let me know. But if you need to copy files back and forth, there's a number of different ways to do it. Okay. All right. The Eclipse tip of the day, as I said, was on, 
let me do this. Eclipse, whoops, uh, Tufts, homework, uh, there we go. The Eclipse tip of the day was on, is going to be on just doing, figuring out memory errors, right? So a number of people, when I graded the assignments, they failed these. You'll see when we get to grading. Unfortunately, the grading system is down right now. But when we get to grading, you'll see uh, where the actual uh, memory faults were. And there's a couple different ways to figure them out. Okay? Since I've gone, uh, since we're talking about like Eclipse a lot in class, I'll show you how you can run this program called Valgrind. And you can run this program called Valgrind on Eclipse, and it will show you exactly where your memory faults are, which is kind of nice. Watch this. I have my homework two up here. I have changed it so that there's some memory leaks in it. Okay? And let's see, here it is. I've changed it so there's some memory leaks. And if I run the program, this is actually test seven from the homework provide, main seven. And, and if you look at it, what does main seven do? Whoops, wrong one, sorry. Main, uh oh, that was not good. Hold on. Main seven does, looks, says the following it tests the remove method. So the remove method is going to remember. The remove method takes a node out of the linked list, right? Remove takes a, takes a node out of the linked list. Like let's say we're removing this one, right? If this was A, B, and C, and we're removing B, what steps do I have to do once I like already found where B is? What steps might I have to do? Uh, change the next of A. So A next, and it might be prev or whatever. Next equals what? equals C, OK, equals B next, probably, because you're probably not going to get all the way to, you're probably not going to have C, but that's OK. OK, and then what else? So that's going to be like that. And then that one's not pointing there anymore. Then what do you have to do? You have to delete, right, which one? B. B. So you probably have to maybe keep a temp somewhere of B, right? But maybe you have, maybe you've already done that. But anyway, you delete B, and that tells the memory system whoosh, it's gone, right? Well, I've actually said, uh, that I've told this program not to do that in some, some form or another. But when you run the program, if I go ahead and just run this, this actually was the proper output for the program. Yet it has a memory leak. What I like forgot to do was the delete B. Does that cause a problem in your running of your program normally? No, it doesn't. It just means if you forgot to do delete B, it just means that B is hanging out here like in empty memory space with nothing pointing to it and can't be recovered until the program ends. Right? And that's not the best idea because that's called a memory leak. If you did this a million times, you'd also have a million pointers or a million nodes hanging out there wasting memory. So we want to avoid that. So if you did do delete B, does that also delete the pointer No. It just deletes the thing that this is it just deletes the, the one that it's pointing at. Which pointer? In B? B OK, so B is a node. And inside B, there's what? There's, a, there's an object, which was what? Card, right? That's the part we need to delete, right? Card C or whatever. And then there's also like a next, a next pointer, which is a, uh, it's a card pointer to next. You don't have to delete a pointer. A pointer gets a pointer you never said new to get the pointer. So the, it just deletes the card, and then it says, oh, it's a pointer. I don't need to delete that. That's nothing to, there's nothing to delete about that. Right? It says, I need to delete the card. And it goes into the cards destructor and deletes the card and whatever. Right? So that's how, that's how that works. So yeah, no, if you do delete B, it doesn't, it doesn't care about what's somewhere else down the line. Good question, though. Yeah. yeah. Does deleting the node delete the card? It does in this case. Because what happens is it cascades through destructors. Right? So when you hit delete, it will call the constructor for B, or the destructor for B, and say, delete B. And then B, and then when that, when, and, and inside that, it will say, delete the card. And then that goes and calls the cards destructor. And then it cascades until all the objects are gone. OK, Nathan? Um, in the other remove methods, the ones that actually return stuff, yes. um, there's no way of actually the card unless you, uh, after you've destroyed the node. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, that's a very good that's a very good question. 
So you're what? Uh, yes, but here's the deal. When you are passing cards back and forth, and you haven't, so if you say, if you say card C, or, or some like temp card, it's card, temp card, if you say something like that, have you used the new keyword? No. If you haven't used the new keyword, what it means is when you, when you leave the function, that gets deleted for you, right? If you return it, it returns a copy of the card to the function that asked for it. And that's actually OK. So when you're returning things, if you return a variable like a car, an object like a card that you didn't create, it will, or that you didn't use new on, it will actually make a copy of that and send the copy back. And that actually works just fine um, because the because cards are so simple, actually, as it turns out. If it had extra pointers and things in there, you'd have a slightly different issue. Many times we want to pass pointers back and forth, but sometimes we just want to pass objects back and forth, and that works fine. Okay? I know this is like delving into some details that you might not want to know, but um, there's, there's a lot of issues involving things. Yes? Um, if something, like if you have a type, like yes. a hand type or something, okay. yep. and Yes. The then things inside it are allocated dynamically, yes. Then when the function ends, yep. uh, does, it, uh, does it know to go to call through the, the D struct? It does, yes. When you do something like hand h, and it's not a pointer, at the end of the function, the function will say, oh, I created that. I'm going to go call the right destructors. Okay. Okay? When, you use, when you use hand star h equals new right. hand, right. Right, that's when you're responsible for it. Okay, that's when your response. And at some point in your program, whatever you created there has to get deleted. Yes. So yes. if you don't use new and the if function is like going through the destructor, the destructor itself. Yes. How come it knows how? Like you didn't write that obviously versus the other one. Oh, I did write the destructor in the hand and the card. It's using that for but for new. Sure. It, is it doesn't use those destructors and it's just creating a variable and it's deleting it at the end of the function. No, it does. It still does behind the scenes. Oh. Okay. Yeah, behind the scenes, you just don't have to worry about it. There's, remember, there's two issues here. If you use the new keyword, you'd better destroy it sometime later in your program, whether it's in a destructor or whether it's in a remove. If you didn't use the new, the new keyword, then the program will handle it for you. Here's the problem. If we don't use the new keyword on, say, a card that we're in, or a card node that we're inserting in, at the end of the function, it goes away. So, if we, so we have to use that if, we're, if we want the node to propagate through the rest of the program, we'd better use the new keyword and say, give me an object that will not go away at the end of this function. And then later, you have to delete it. Okay? All right. Let me get back to this for a sec. In this program, this looked fine. And you might say, great, I'm, I'm finished. Turns out, I didn't actually realize this until this morning when I was looking it up. Right? You can actually, if you click on the, if you click on the uh, project name, and then you right click. It's a little tricky on a Mac sometimes through the thing, but I think it's you have to set up X11 to uh, mimic, emulate a three button mouse like that. And then if you click Command, which is like control clicking on it, it will bring up a little window, hopefully. Now I'm lying to you. There we go. It brings up a little window. And if you go down to that window and it says profile as, guess what? One of the options down here is profile with this thing called Valgrind. Valgrind is a memory checker. It goes through your program and it, it, it lists, or it keeps track of every time you use new. And then at the end of the program, it says, did you delete every time you use everything that you use new on? And it like keeps track of all that for you, right? And you can run this and you can profile with Valgrind. And you click profile with Valgrind and then it will run it. And guess what? It says, hey, there's 16 bytes in one box are definitely lost in record one of one. And then you go down here and you go, oh, in my inserted index, what's really cool is you click on that and it says, this one was never removed. Right? That's pretty cool. Right? It says, this one was never removed. So then you have to go through your code and you have to go, oh, where would I have removed that one? Well, there might be a couple other places, like in the remove function, where maybe I forgot to put delete, something like that. Okay, so it'll tell you right there. Now, for those of you who don't want to use uh, Eclipse, 
You can actually run Valgrind as well. Let me see. Uh, where did I put this? Temp slash um, homework to Valgrind, maybe? Yes. OK. If I, uh, let's see. Uh-oh, hang on. Then make file. I think I already did it here. That oh, there it is. I don't know where my mouse is now because I can't see. Or my oh no, I can't see a thing. This is what happens when you. Uh, oh no. There it is. I think I got it now. Let's hope. Make there we go. So if you make it on the command line and then you type dot slash homework two, it'll show your output. But if you want to use Valgrind, you just type Valgrind, V-A-L-G-R-I-N-D, and then dot slash homework2 as if you were running it from the command line. And then it will run val this thing called Valgrind and tell you a whole bunch of stuff about it. It says, look, in use at exit, 16 bytes in one block. That's your memory leak. right? Total heap usage. It tells you all this stuff. And then it says, uh, let's see, it says, um, Definitely lost 16 bytes in one block. So that's how, and that's actually what we ran for the test on your homework after you provided it to say, hey, guess did you did you do this? Okay. Question. What would it look like if you didn't have any? Oh, now you're gonna now you're gonna make me go to my other one. Hang on. Let's see if I can do this one. Uh, homework two valgrind dot slash homework two. And it says, all heap blocks were freed. No leaks are possible. Right? Tells you, hey, you did the right thing. Yeah? Uh, it says 16 blocks definitely lost. 16 bytes, I believe. Yeah. yeah. But what about the, you need to worry about the possibly lost or all, all those other categories? Uh, yeah, well, at the end it will say, if it doesn't say this, all heap blocks were freed, then you know you've got something wrong. Right? It'll tell you the thing. Yeah, question. Uh, actually, Valgrind can be used for seg faults. I have never been hugely successful with it, but other people have. You, when, you, when you get a seg fault, if you run it through Valgrind, sometimes it will say, hey, you failed here. Right? I'd rather just use a debugger. But Valgrind is a tool that you could use for that. Yeah, good question. Yeah. Now, if, if, if the function doesn't get, if, so Valgrind just checks through the execution path. If, if there's something kind of off on the side that might leak in, in, a, in an edge case, it will, it won't, will it not check for that? Yes. Yeah, that's a very good question. Valgrind does not do what we call static analysis. It will not look through every little <laughs> corner of your program and say, oh, you're going to leak here. Only if things get tested, which is why for the tests that I ran last night on all your code, I made it do Valgrind at every single test. And then you know, it uh, found a lot of memory leaks. <laughs> right? Again, this is not something to be too worried about. I might take off like a couple points or a few points for memory leaks on this one. But in the future, you should probably run Valgrind on your programs with all the tests that you do, because I assume you're writing lots of tests yourself, not just running it through provide. Um, running the test yourself, running Valgrind on it, and seeing what the, what the output is. Yeah? Uh, is there a way that we can add it to, like, so if we wanted to test a whole bunch of different things all at once, is mm -hmm. there a way to do that, or do we have to do one test at a time? You, well, you, there's a number of different ways to do it. My, I like to run one test to do one thing at a time. And if it crashes, I know exactly where I need to go. Right? Other people like to run the whole battery test at once. And if it crashes in some, then you figure out where it is that it's crashing individually. And it keeps it maybe a little more compact. But it's up to you. Totally up to you. Yeah, there, there, you, you could write a little script to run them all like I, we've done. But that's probably more advanced than you want to get into right now. Yeah. Other questions on that? OK, you can either do Valgrind through, the, through Eclipse or on the command line. Either way is, is fine. Okay. Anything else? All right. All right. So let's go in. Oh, let me comment briefly on homework three, I guess we're up to now. I'll put homework three up on uh, Sunday. I got it to you guys late, so I'm giving you uh, until next a week from this coming Friday to do it. In the middle of that, we have a mid-year. So if we get too stressed out, I might extend the deadline a little bit if people are like, I don't know what's going on. But the, let's get to that. Let's cross that bridge when we get to it. Um, this assignment, I think I mentioned this the other day. It's about, and you could have looked at it online if you wanted to, it's about uh, like a, a pretend ISIS class that has a class and two and, and, and has two wait lists. Okay? Yeah, we did go. We did a whole thing on the queues with that. So, 
Um, hopefully it isn't too confusing. Some people were getting a little confused with the, the enumerator, the enum, which uh, is a type in C++. Look on Piazza, there's some discussion about that. Uh, if you have lots of questions on that, I can go over it the other day. But it's basically pretend it's just another type. That's really all you have to do as, uh, with enums. Okay. Any questions so far on homework three? Yes. Yep. Like this, and then Good question. Depend. So the question was, do you, so there's this type, this enum, which I have put inside the class for the course, the class for the course. And because it's inside there, you have to do, you have to put the course or the class uh, name with two colons uh, anytime you're using it outside of that class. So in other words, let's say, and, and most, most of the stuff you write won't be outside of that class. But if you look at the main.cpp, I've given a lot of, like a whole bunch of examples in there of how to use the stuff, and you'll see that that's when you need to use it. Otherwise, you can just say enrollment. Don't need to put the ISIS colon colon enrollment if you're inside the class. Okay. Don't need to do that. Yep. Question, because you said about midterms. Yeah. Um, are they no longer in labs? Yeah, so the midterms are not going to be in labs this time. I actually have to be away. Anybody going to Grace Hopper as well as me? A couple, couple people are. Um, there's a conference for female computer scientists, and if you are female and want to attend next year, uh, you should think about it. Let me know, and we'll get you on the list for getting an email about it next year. Um, but anyway, that's going to be what it is. So we're going to do it during class. The TAs are going to uh, proctor it, and uh, that's that. Shouldn't be shouldn't be too too bad. I will do a review session on mon. Mm, when am I going to do the review session? Is it this Wednesday already? I forget exactly when it is. It's got to be soon because ne- no, no, it's it's not. Sorry, it's next Monday. I'm thinking ahead on when Columbus Day is, but it's next Monday. We'll do a review session for the mid-year. Question now. Just what will the mid-year cover? I will talk about that during the mid- review session, but it will be everything we've covered up till now, not including the Unix tips of the day or Eclipse tips of the day or anything to do with like the provide. Nothing to do with like logistics, right? Just just. Linked list dynamic arrays, SACs, queues, trees, etc. Yep. So officially, what day is the? The Wednesday, the eighth, I believe it is, yeah. of October. Now, if you have like six other exams that day, or three other exams, or two other exams, email me. We'll work something out. I don't want to, especially because I have the schedule wrong to begin with. So I'll, we'll work something out. Okay. Yep. Are there any previous year ones? Um, I can probably make a previous year one available if you want. It won't be, it won't, some of the questions you'll go, I don't know what you're talking about because it was on thing, but yeah, we can do that, sure. It used to be when I was in college that like fraternities and sororities would keep big like, like file cabinets of old exams and things, so. Do they still do that? Yeah, I figured. Probably a Comp 15 exam or two hanging out there. All right, yeah. Regular class time. Yep, regular class time. And if you want, you could go to the evening one if you didn't want to go to this one or whatever. And we, we can be pretty flexible about that. You do have to bring your ID, though. We have had people trying to take other people's exams before, which is too bad. Bring your, if you don't have a student ID, bring a picture ID that shows that it's you. Because the TAs have to check that, unfortunately. In the same place? Same place, right here. Yep. All right. Other questions? Let's go on to trees. <coughs> so we have talked so far about dynamic array. We have, talked about, uh, we have talked about linked lists. Those are both data structures, like underneath the covers. That's what you're using to make your lists or et cetera. We have talked about abstract data types. Namely, uh, we have talked about the stack, and we have talked about the queue, also generally for lists and things. <coughs> The next one that we're going to talk about is a little different. It's another, it is an abstract data type. In other words, under the covers, you can implement it in a number of different ways. Normally, we implement trees using linked data structures. I will show you why, what, what, the, what that means in a little bit. But, a lot, but what we're trying to do with trees is we're trying to get the fact that Linear data structures are not always the best way to go through data. Okay, we've already talked about some of this, some of this before. Okay, in fact, I'll uh, I'll do the. Let me move the screen up here. I'll do a little kind of motivation on what we're going to do here.
Okay. Remember when we had a linked list or a, a an array? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I'll make it seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I'll make it seven pieces along. If we had random numbers in here, 7 and 3 and 9 and 14 and 12 and 8 and 7 again, right? Searching through that list was kind of hard, right? OK. So one of the things we can do is to do what to make it easier to search through this? We can sort it, right? And sorting, all right, sorting on a, on a list is a little bit, on like a dynamic array is a little bit tricky. Okay, I'm not going to remember all these numbers, but I'll make them in some order, numbers in order here, right? Let's say uh, 3 and 9 and 21 and 43 and 44 and uh, 80 and 102. Okay, 3, 9, 21. Now that's in order. What was the way that we searched before using binary search in here? What did we actually do? Couple people out there. Charlie, you have an answer today. What's up? Split the list in half. And then Split the list in half, right? We go to the middle, whatever the middle is for seven, right? It might be the 43 or the 44, depending on which one you uh, you care about here, right? Uh, wait a minute. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It's actually no. It's actually the 43. Yeah. We go to the middle. We'd see if that number was bigger or smaller than the one we were looking for. Then what would we do? Smaller, go to the left. If it's bigger, go to the right. OK. And that actually makes it so we cut the problem in half, right? And what kind of asymptotic behavior did we say that was? Yeah, logarithmic, right? Log of n. Normally, we, we can put the base 2 down there, but normally we just assume it's base 2 because we're computer scientists, right? If we want to use this, watch this kind of fun little like dropping out of uh, of, of data that I'll, I'll show you in a sec. If you go to 43, right, and you go halfway the other direction, right, and then put the 9 down here, and you go halfway the other direction, and you put the 80 down here, right, and then you go halfway this way, and the only thing left is, is the 102, right, 102, and you go halfway the other side, and you get 44. Right? And if you go halfway over here, this 21 might drop down like this. And then the 3 might drop down like this. Take a look at what, if I, if I do it like this, take a look at what we've got now. Now we've got a path that we can travel that does the splitting in half for us. Okay? If we start at 43 and the number, let's say, let's say the number we were looking for was 21. Okay, we go to 43, right? And we know it's less than 21. Which one do we go to next? The 9, right? And we're looking for 21, and we know that 21 is bigger than 9, so which one do we go to next? The one that's bigger, right? And take a look at this interesting observation here. What's, what's special about everything to the left of 43? Smaller. Is everything to the right? Bigger. This structure right here, let me erase all this other stuff. This structure is a tree. Okay? Why is it a tree? Well, we'll get into some more details about that in a second. But it kind of looks like that tree from the first page, right? except upside down. Doesn't it look like almost directly upside down from this tree here? Like, here's the root, right? and these are like the leaves. So it's the tree Foop, flipped upside down. Ah, interesting, huh? So. So this is the actual way we do this. Now, think about linked lists for a second. Can't we just say that isn't the linked list basically like follow in some direction? In fact, with a linked list, it's the next, right? In this case, we're going to follow either left or right, right? And so as it turns out, it's a really easy way to model these things called trees is by a node with in this case, this is what we call a binary tree. I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. But each node has either a left or a right, and you follow it depending on whatever rules you're following here. Okay? So that's like, kind of like the motivation. You saw the, link, the, the array kind of fall down into a linked list or into a linked structure 
which in this case is what we call a tree. And it looks a little bit like a tree. Okay. All right. So we are going to be doing lots more stuff in this trees. Now, let's, uh, we're going to actually look at trees that aren't these binary trees first, as it turns out. Again, it's kind of backwards than the way a lot of people do it, but I think it, you've actually seen lots of tree structures and not even known it. The big one is a file system. Okay, as it turns out, if, you are in a, if you're in a directory, doesn't that directory have a whole bunch of files in it, some of which might be directories? Right? And then each directory underneath that directory has its own set of files. And that's also a tree structure. Okay, we'll, we'll see how that uh, works. We're going to talk about how trees can evaluate arithmetic expressions. Remember when we were talking about stacks and we did that thing on uh, postfix notation? You'll see that again in a minute, or a few minutes. We've already kind of talked about this, how trees can, reverse, can do fast searching. Right? Charlie says, hey, look, split the, split the dynamic array into two pieces each time. This is exactly doing that. If I go left, I've split the tree in two. And half of these things don't matter anymore. And then if I go down here and I go right, I've split this, these in two. And you can think about how that, for a really big tree, that actually saves a lot of time, splitting two, splitting two, splitting two. Okay? And then, as I said, we make it into sets in a little bit. All right, so let's get step back one sec. What is a tree? Like, what, is computer, what do computer scientists define as a tree? It's this collection of nodes. We already would know what a node is, right? In this case, we're going to model them with like circles and numbers in, inside them, right? It's a collection of nodes, but you can think linked list nodes, the same idea, like a data with some, like, with some links going out of it, right? Uh, the, the tree could be empty. If there's nothing in the tree, it's just an empty tree. If it's not empty, we have this thing called the root. The root is where all trees start. Again, it's upside down from your like normal like biological tree, but this is what we call the root. Okay? And then the root has these subtrees, which each individually have their own roots, and then just so on, so on, and so on. It's a very recursive definition, as it turns out. Okay? And then these roots are connected by what we call a directed edge. That's actually a term from graph theory, which means that if I have a, if I have a node here and it's got a couple of, if I have a, a node here and it's got, that was a terrible, like I can't even put this on the board right there. We go, whoop, there. If you have a node and then two follow-on nodes, right, the fact that we can only go from the root downwards to the, the ones below it, you can't go upwards. That means it's directed. And there's a reason you can't go upwards, as it turns out. But, um, and in some cases, you can. But uh, for our purposes for now, we're just going to con consider going down the tree, starting at the top and going down the tree. Okay? And that's these uh, directed edges from R, or directed edges from the root. There's the root. Here's an edge. And here's an edge next to it. So a root and then two nodes and both connected to by edges back up to the root. Okay. All right, so far so good? Not too bad. Here's a nice big example tree. Okay. This one's different than the one we had up here, this binary one. This is called an n-ary tree. It's a tree that has like multiple uh, nodes below the root, and each one can be multiple nodes. This is the one that's like a file system. Okay. This is kind of like a file system, right, where you've got let's say the root directory, and then you've got the files coming off it, and then this one happens to be another, D happens to be another, uh, has its own uh, internal files, so that would be another directory. E would be a directory, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? But the big term right here is that A is called the root. B is a child of A. They go back and forth between like this tree-based uh, concept uh, like the biological tree analogy and this kind of like family tree analogy. I don't know why they never quite got it like t together, but anyway, they, they kind of mix and match a little bit. B is a child of A. C, D, E, F, and G are also children of A. H is a child of D, etc. Not hard, right? F is a child of A, but also a parent of K, L, and M. Notice they've gone down this this like. Uh, family tree thing. So F is a child of A and a parent of K, L, and M. What do you think K, L, and M are? They're siblings. Yeah, okay. Why are they siblings? Because they both have the same parent. 
right? Yes. Uh, are children of parents children of the parent of the parents? OK. If we want to go down that path, we can go down that path. What's K's relationship to A? Grandchild. <laughs> Right? Yeah, you could do a great grandchild of A is P, right? You could do that if you really wanted to. But again, it's much, much like with linked lists. If you find yourself doing like the, the left, right, left business, you're probably doing something wrong because you don't want to go that far down the tree without like thinking about what your model is. Yeah. Hey, one sec. Yeah. Uh, so since you said like the, you can have the roots like under each root is like a new root. Yeah. Well, yeah, OK. So the root of this tree is A, right? F, while of this, its own little subtree, you could say F is the root of its subtree. We generally don't. We generally say, look, A is the root of the tree. F is just a child of A, and then et cetera. But yeah, you, you could if you wanted to. I mean, if we're talking about subtrees, then sure, you could do that. Alex, you had a question? So if there's ever a point in our code where we're like, J is the cousin of K. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're probably not. You're right. Once you get into like cousins and second cousins, once you're moved and all that, no, you're you're not gonna you're not actually gonna deal with that too often. Although you'll see in a minute how we do have one model for the directory structure, which is uh, kind of uh, kind of interesting in that sense. Okay. Note something here. You can go ahead and count these, right? But if there are n nodes, there are always n minus one edges because the only one, because everybody has a parent except for the root. That makes sense. It's always just one fewer edge than nodes. Okay. All right. Let's talk about a couple other details here. The red nodes in this picture are the ones that don't have any children. They are called leaves, right? It's just like the bio back to the biological tree again, right? These are called leaves, and they're called leaves because they're at the end of the tree, and that's it. There's no no other like branches off of them. I guess, the, I guess the edges could be called branches if you want, but I've never heard that in real, real life. Okay? Those are all leaves. Okay? G is almost a leaf, but it does have one child, so it's definitely not, in this case, the only leaf in this, this part of the tree is N. Okay? We already did this. Nodes with the same parent are siblings. I tried to color this so it would make sense, but anything that's the same color is the sibling. So. Uh, Siblings are always on the same level, and we'll get to what that means in a second. But notice siblings are not, there's no way to have a sibling like lower or higher than its own. Like that wouldn't make any sense. You can, you can kind of model family trees with these. But the problem with modeling family trees with, with a tree like this is that you've got weird relationships. Like, what if cousins marry each other? Then you've got other weird you know, things. And, I mean, it happens, right? So you've got you know, weird weirdness going on that you can't quite model with this. That gets into graph theory. George R. R. Martin hates this kind of thing. Right, right. George R. Martin hates this one. He hates this one. Right, right. OK, so, these are, so that's siblings. Um, we can define what we call a path from a parent to its children and uh, to actually to, the, to any of the leaves, if you want, right? The root can get to any other leaf by going down the tree, right? Or any, the root can get to any leaf by traversing down the tree, right? And we call that it's the path from the parent to the, to the, root, to the leaf here, right? The path A, E, J, and O has a length of how many edges? One, two, three. A, E, J, and O has a length of three, right? Because it's the number of steps you have, number of jumps you have to go to get to the, the bottom one. Okay? That's what, we, that's what we call this one. We can actually define the depth of a node, right? The depth of a node, which is the length from the root. If we're at the root, what's our depth? Zero. Yeah, you might think one, but it's zero. The root has a depth of zero, okay, because it's zero from the root. And then the other ones, uh, depending on how many steps you have to take, that's their depth. So J has a depth of two, and O has a depth of three, right? The height of a tree is the longest, or the height of a node, rather, is the longest path from that node to a leaf. That gets a little tricky. Because notice, the height of A 
is not 1, 2, because it takes two jumps to get to n. The height of a is actually, you've got to look down the farthest you can go. The height of a is 1, 2, 3, because it goes all the way. It goes from a to e to j to o. Okay. That's how you figure out the, the height of a node. You've got to figure out which, what the, to the longest uh, the longest path is. So the height of the tree in this case is 1, 2, 3, because it's uh, three jumps down to the farthest leaf. Okay. I know there's a lot of terminology here, but once you get this down, you go, oh, OK, I can talk about these things. Kind of like biology, I guess. Questions on so far? OK. The height of the tree, I said this, the height of the tree is the height of the root. Right? So the height of this tree, even though it goes four down, we still just say that the height is three. Because it only takes three jumps to go from the top to the bottom, if you're starting at the root. Okay. All right, so yeah, we already talked about this. Nodes have, well, we kind of did. Nodes have ancestors, and they have descendants. Again, going back to the biological, right? right? Any time you can get from a node to another node, it's either a descendant or an ancestor. Okay, so O is a descendant of J and a descendant of E and a descendant of A. E is an ancestor of P because it came before it, right? E is not an ancestor of K, even though they're kind of linked through the node. It's not an ancestor of K. It's only the ones you can get to. Okay. Question? Could you somehow have two trees that had were connected just in some places, or is that getting confused? Two trees that are just connected in some places. What do you mean? Yeah. And Z, a child of Z was F, and then it had a Sure. Name. Well, well ki- kind of. You can't have, you can't have a, a node that's not the root of the tree hanging out with no parent. So you have to be able to figure it out so that the only place on this tree where you could connect another tree that would make sense is at A or below at any of the leaves. Does that make sense? You can't come halfway th- over and just connect them like that. No, it's not a tree in that case anymore. Um, you have to connect them in the, in the right place. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, good question. If I connected O, we're not in tree territory anymore. We're in graph territory, which is later in the year. Yeah, remember, the tree is a very regular structure. Graphs are like the Wild West, right? Trees are, trees are very regular. You've got parents, you've got children, that's it. You can't have more than one parent. Because in that case, O would have parents of like I and J. And this, this is like a single parent family. <laughs> right? OK, all these are, I guess. In the sense that you, you can't have more than one in this case. Yeah, good question. Uh, who else had another question? Yes, uh, go ahead. What is I in relationship to L? I in relationship to L. L. Oh. Or sorry, to O? Uh, uncle, I guess, or aunt, depending on whether you, <laughs> right? Yep. Yeah, so it's, I mean, you could, but I would, I've never used, you've never really, you wouldn't really use that. And by the way, if you're traversing this tree and somehow you were looking for I and using whatever you were and you got to O, you've probably got a problem. Like if you, if you go somewhere and you end up at O before you end up at I, unless you're going to backtrack and go the other direction, which we do, we do backtrack recursively, you'll see that in a little bit, but, but um, yeah, you're probably going doing something a little hokey. Okay, but I thought you could only go in one direction. You can. You, well, okay. <laughs> Very good question. You can only go in one direction, but if you do things recursively, you will go in a direction and then backtrack, much like our maze the other day. When you backtrack, you get back to where you were, and then you can go the other direction. So we could go, let's say we always went left. We go A to E to I, and then we couldn't go left anymore, and every time we couldn't go left or right, we'd backtrack and then go the other one. We could go A, E, I, backtrack. Oh, we already went left, let's go right, but then we'll always go left. Right, left. Boom, 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 boom. You see what I mean? You can do that. You can do that. Yeah. Th- this tree's a little weird because it's a, you know, got more than two. Binary trees are easy that way. Um, these ones are a little harder. You'll see. You'll, we're gonna, don't worry. We'll go through enough examples here that you'll, you'll get it. Okay? All right. How do we actually implement trees? Now, this is a good question. I've showed you that we can implement trees in a binary tree pretty easily. We have a node, we have a left, we have a right, we're good to go. These weird trees that have multiple children, there's a problem with that, 
right? There's a problem with like figuring out how to represent a tree if you don't know the number of children beforehand. Okay, there is a way to do it. We'll show you, I'll show you one in a few in a minute. But the problem is we can't just have a, a node link to each child, right? Because if you're doing like linked lists were easy, right? Linked lists where there's one next or a previous if you're doing a doubly linked list, right? But let's pretend this was a node for a tree, right? Okay, you have some data in here, and then you have like, I don't know, child one, child two pointers, right? Child three point, and then you add more children. What does this start to look like? Like what can we, how can we model this little thing in here? A what? Dynamic array. A dynamic array. You could have this being a dynamic array, absolutely. Yep, you certainly could. And that's one way we could do it, right? You could have a dynamic array and do that. But it's a little weird that way because now to get through things, you've got to look through a bunch of dynamic arrays to dynamic arrays. But that's definitely right. You could also do it with a linked list. Inside here, you could have like the children be a linked list. We can do that, right? But then you've got the, it, but then you've got like this kind of a weird, well, it gets a little bit weirder. I'll show you what we one way to do it, which is similar to this. We can do it this way. This diagram here, okay, this diagram here, A and so in this case, E, F, and G are still children of A, even though I didn't I've drawn this differently now. Okay? A, F, and G are all children of A. But what I've done is I've come up with this model, which is a little hokey, but it's a model that says, OK, you have a first child, right? Anybody, anybody the first child in here? Like if you have siblings? Yeah, a number of people. How about second or third or fourth or eighth or whatever, right? Yeah, about the other half. Um, so think about this. If you're, if you, and, and the, the, the uh, eldest child will not, will not really understand this. The youngest, younger children understand this. If you're a younger child, how many pictures of you do your parents have versus how many of your older sibling? Right? None, right? Like, I was, I happen to be, an, I have a younger sister, and I'm the oldest, and I have a younger sister. And you look back, and, and my sister was always getting matched. Like, wow, there's like half as many pictures, if that. Like, my parents were a snap crazy when back when, you know, back when I was born. But then my sister came on and I'm like, ah, we're too tired to take more pictures. Right? So I kind of feel bad about that. But, um, so in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to say first child, and then all the first children are going to have a, a, another link called next sibling. Right? Next sibling, next sibling, next sibling. Right? And then they'll also have a first child as well. Okay? This is how we're going to model this one. It's, it's definitely a little weird and a little out there, but I figured I might as well throw it out there and, and show you what it is here. If you go downwards in this case, you get to a first child. All right, first child. If you go sideways, you go to next siblings. And this is the actual struct right here. What's nice about this is it's, there's only two pointers here, and you can represent the whole tree using this method. So it's kind of nice. Charlie? Yes, you absolutely would have to access. If you want to get to G, you've got to go from A to A's first child and then start walking along siblings to get to G. So yeah, it's definitely more work, but it saves the idea of having this be another weird data structure like a dynamic array or something like that. You don't, even, don't need any other data structures here. That's the one nice thing about this method. Yes? If you're using that method and you knew the height, is it height of the tree? Yeah. Could you make that in a row? You probably could, but again, it needs another data structure, right? The only nice thing about this is you don't you have just nodes, and nodes connect to nodes, and this actually works. That's why it's kind of neat. But again, this is like this is like a weird way to start. I just figured I'd show you this interesting way of just doing many node trees, like n -ary trees, trees that have more than just one or two children, right? Or for that matter, one child. Okay. You guys had a. Were you guys discussing anything interesting? Well, so A's yep. next sibling is point to null. A's next sibling points to null. Yes. Yep. 
Yep, and same with G's next sibling would point to null. Everybody on the right here, they're going to just point to null for their next siblings, right? And anybody who doesn't have children, their first child is null as well. Okay? We can model a uh, weak, this is not widely used. You will not see this too, too often, right? But we can model uh, the file system this way. If A is a directory, anything that's starred here, this is slide 19, anything that's starred here is a directory, okay? If A is a directory and its first child is E, and that's a directory, and it has two children, I and J, notice only because I does not have any children, it's a file. Okay, you could have a directory with, with no files in it, but for now we're not going to worry about that. Okay, and you can go, and everybody else on, the, on level one here has, uh, is, a, is a directory, and then there's files underneath it and so forth. We can model this this way. Okay, and you can do the listing of these things recursively, which is also pretty cool. Okay, you can actually look through this recursively. There's a lot of code right here. This is, not, this is not that hard to understand. Recursive functions need what parts to them? Base case, solve the problem, like start working towards a problem and then recurse. OK, here's the base case. We're going to list all of these, like we're going to list them out, OK? Base case, if node is null, return. If you're in a null node, forget it. You're, not, you're done listing. And then you print your node. And the print node takes the node and the depth. The reason it takes the depth is so that it knows how to actually format it. I'll show you the formatting in a bit. This code is online if you want to look at it. I'm not going to show you all the code in here, the code, but the code is online here. Okay? If, we're, if, 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 if you're printing the node and then you have no, uh, if you are, let's see, if you're printing the node and, uh, let's see, if you are not a, did I do this wrong? If you are not a directory, then uh, you actually, let's see. If you are, yeah, you're right. I think, I think I'm looking at it now, and I'm looking at, I know this works because I tried it. So say again? You do all that stuff in the directory, so you go down the. Right, but let's say we go from here and then here. Oh, sorry, if it is a directory, you're right. We do all this. So it's right. You're right. OK, so if it's a directory, and then if it's a directory, you list all the first child and then the depth plus one. So if it's a directory, you list the first child and then you start over again, right? And then you go to the and then you go to the uh, next sibling, right? And you do that. Uh, let's see. First child, and then you go to the next sibling, and then you do the same thing. And you list all for the siblings. Okay, so it's actually kind of a like a dual recursive thing going on. Yes. Oh boy, would it be constant or linear? Yeah, in this case, so in this case, you're actually going to each node once. So what's that going to be? Linear. Yeah, you're going. You're going to even though it's compacted here, you're going to each node once. Okay, but anyway, so you, so let's just let's just walk down a couple just to see. If we start at A, it is not null, so we print it. So we print A. And then if it's a directory, it is. Then we list all first child. Okay, so then we go here and we list this one's first child. Okay? And then so this one goes back up to list all. It's not null. And then we print it. And then we, uh, let's see, it's a directory, so we list this one. So you see how we're going down here? We get to this one. And we print it, and it's not a directory, so we bump, we recursively go back up here, and then we need to go to this one's first child, and then do this. So it does work if you walk through the whole thing. Okay, so it's kind of neat. Let's see. I believe this is what it looks like when you actually print it out. I put tabs in there to show you, but notice it looks kind of like a nice directory structure. Okay, A has E, F, and G as children. E has I and J as children, J has O and P as children, etc. Okay, and it actually prints out. You can, you can, again, you can see the code online for the how these prints out, how these print out. But it's a nice recursive definition for what it's worth. It's a nice recursive way of going through this and printing out a readable file structure. Okay, you can get ls to print something like this where it tabs over the files and folders and all that, like if you're listing a directory. 
And by the way, it will also print whether or not it's a directory too. So look at the code. It's kind of it's kind of nice. Yeah, Ben. This is a case where, it, yeah, this is a case where you make sense to use recursion. I mean, if you've got a directory structure that's, you know, millions of files, you'll probably run out of stack space. But, um, but in this case, it may, it's a nice, pretty problem anyway for recursion. Yeah, good question. Anything else on the directory structure? Okay, let's go back. So that was the kind of weird part of the nodes. Later in the later in the semester, we'll talk about these things called tries which also have multiple nodes coming off them. And you'll see how we handle those as well. But let's get back to the original motivational tree here, okay? called a binary tree. Okay? Here's the deal with binary trees. Because we know that there's, on, there's always only two children, that's what binary tree is all about, okay? two children at most, could have none, could have one, then you can very easily model this with a node structure right, called left, which is a pointer, and right, which is a pointer. And then each left and right also have pointers to lefts and rights, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it's another kind of a beautiful definition here. Okay? Here's what, this is just what it looks like in struct form. Right? You've got some element of whatever the data is. And then you've got left and you've got right. Okay? And notice here. Okay, it's very regular. These are like a really regular system. Left, right, left, right, left, right, all the way down. Fairly compact, fairly easy to deal with. And whenever you go one direction, you have cut whatever problem you're dealing with in half. Very nice to know. Okay. The depth of a binary tree is interesting. Regular old generic binary trees could look like this. How can that be a binary tree? Yeah. Because the, for each of these, the left is null. Yeah. Then, the left is null in each one, yeah? And you can see how in a situation, for instance, where data is like entered in order. Sure. It could end up like this. Yeah, it could absolutely end up like this. Remember how we talked, we, like this like little binary tree thing here? We're going to talk about binary trees next time on Wednesday, right? On, and, in fact, these things called binary search trees, where we're trying to insert in a particular order. But if this was 1, 2, 3, and 4, and you always had to insert the bigger one to the, in this case, to the right, then you would insert A, and then B would be bigger, so you'd insert B to the right, and then C to the right, and then D to the right. What kind of structure does this devolve into? Linked list, right? So binary trees are not perfect, because they, they can devolve into this this interesting form, which is just like a linked list. And you have to be careful with that. And that's why there's like a whole other topic. In fact, we'll spend like probably three quarters of a class talking about how to make sure that this doesn't happen in binary trees. Okay? The average depth, okay? I had a big discussion with my TAs last semester when I said this in class. I said the average depth is the square root of the number of nodes that's only in the trees that are like not such that there's some on left, some on the right, and whatever. Like if it's kind of a random tree, square root of n, right? You can get it to be n minus 1 if we have a nice regular tree, which, well, like this one, that has like even number on both sides. And even number on both sides would make it nice and regular. And so the uh, average depth is actually the number of nodes minus one on average. You can get it to there. Yeah. No, isn't n minus one database? Uh, oh, sorry. You're right. You're right. I'm backwards. It's log n in this case. You're right. It's log n in this case. In this case, it's n minus one in terms of the height. You're absolutely right. Yeah, Chuck. So by average depth, you mean if you pick the depth. random node in the tree, then it's the, the average depth? depth. No, I mean the average depth from the root. Like the average depth from the root could be up. Yeah, if you have a full tree structure. No, no, I'm saying if you have a number of random trees and you look at the average depth of all those trees from the root for all those trees, the average could be would generally be square root of n. Yeah. If you just have, if you had a random like just putting nodes in wherever they left or right randomly, you'll get that way. Yeah, good question. Good question. Okay. So we can we gotta deal with this at some point. We're not gonna deal with it quite yet. Okay. We 
Let's go through a couple of different types of binary trees. Like there's more definitions and things. Kind of annoying, but there's definitions. The degenerate tree is the one we're talking about, where every node only has one child. This is the weird linked lists degenerate node. It could be like the one we just looked at, or it could be this one where it goes left, right, left, right, left, right. That's still going to be a problem because you're limited in the number of like different directions you can go. You can only always you can always only go in one direction. <coughs> not not really that great. Okay. There's a tree called a full binary tree. Okay. And this means if it's full, it means every node except for the leaves has two children. Okay. Meaning that if we stuck an, uh, one node off of B or a node off of D or a node off of B, it would no longer be a full binary tree. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, full. No single children. That is different than what we call, and unfortunately they use this term and it, they, they always confuse me, a complete binary tree. Okay, a complete binary tree looks like this. Complete binary tree, every level except the last is completely filled and the nodes are as far left as possible. Now, there is a reason we care about complete binary trees. Okay? If we always fill the tree, left, right, left, right, left, right, and as we go down the tree, A is going to be first, then we're going to fill left, and then we're going to fill right of A. Then we're going to go down to B, because we can't do any more on A and B. We're going to go left, then we're going to fill left of B, then right of B, and we can't do any more here, so we're going to go back over to C, and we're going to go left of C. See how it fills out in a nice regular pattern? That's how you create a complete binary tree. We will get to these when we talk about this thing called a heap in a couple weeks. And uh, it, you, it's nice because this is actually a very compact way. There's a very compact way of representing this that's not node based. We'll get to that. OK, but this is a complete binary tree. Every level except the possibly the last is completely filled, and the nodes are as far left as possible. OK, you can have a complete binary tree that's not a full binary tree. This one is the case of that, right? You can have a full binary tree that is not a complete binary tree. This one is that. So they are distinct, and they're not like subsets of each other. Okay. All right, any questions on those two? That's it for the types of trees we're going to worry about. There's a cool use case for these binary trees. I see some people looking and going, what is going on up there? Right. We can actually take our arithmetic and model it using a binary tree. This is kind of cool. It only works for binary operations, obviously. But it's kind of cool, right? This plus up at the root says add this side and this side together. right? And then this plus next to, to the left of the, uh, the root says add the A and add the B times C together. Ah, this is kind of neat. You can actually represent arithmetic this way. Right? And if you do what we call post order traversal, remember post fix notation? If we do post order traversal, you can actually print out the post fix notation from this tree. I'm going to walk you through that in a second. You can also do what we call an in order traversal, which, if you parenthesize properly, we'll put this, print this out in the regular arithmetic in fix notation we've talked about that you guys have learned since second grade. And you can also do a prefix, which would print it in that or pre uh, order traversal, which we'll do it in the prefix one. I'm just going to go over the postfix. It's really clever. And you're going to do this in a lab um, next week or the week after. I think next week. OK, watch this. Here's the recursive traversal algorithm. Remember how easy the maze traversal algorithm was? Go north, go east, go south, go west, you're done. Recurse, right? That's it. Same thing here. Post order traversal algorithm. Traverse left, traverse right, print the node, return. That's it. And that actually goes from this into the post fix notation. Let's see if we can follow it for this one. OK, you ready for this? Got to get our pencils ready for this one because it's a little tricky. All right, we are at the root. What's the, the recursive algorithm say? Traverse left. Now we are back at the first thing again. We're in a new, a new traversal. What are we going to do at this one? 
Traverse left. Okay, we're now at A, what are we going to do? We're going to traverse left, but can we? No, so we just return, that's our base case. Right, we're going to return, can we traverse right? No, so we return, then what do we do? Print the node, A. And then we return. Now, returning, what did we just do from this plus? We traverse left, so what are we going to do now? Traverse right, and what are we going to do with this one? Traverse left. Ah, you guys got it. Now, B, can't go left, can't go right, return, or can't go left, can't go right, print. Sorry, I, I jumped the gun. Print, right? OK, we just went left. Now we're going to go right. Can't go left, can't go right for the C, print. OK, back up here, what did we just finish doing? Right. Going right, so what's next? Print times, right? We've done that. Now, what did we just finish doing for the plus? So print, right, is next. We just went right. Plus, what do we do next? Go right, right? And then we go from here, we go left, left, left. Yeah? Can't go left, can't go right. We're at the D now. Can't go left, can't go right. So we print it. Back up here, go right. Can't go left, can't go right. Print it. Back up here, we just went right. So we print it, right? And then we go back up here, we go right, can't go left, can't go right, print it. OK, back up here, we just went right, print it. Back up here, go right, G, can't go left, can't go right, print it. Go back up here, we just went right, we print it. Back up to the plus, we just went right, print it. OK, you see how we went through that whole thing? And now that's the postfix notation for that tree. Kind of neat, which also means that if you have postfix, you can go back into a tree notation if you want. These kind of tree notations, very similar to this idea, is what happens when your programs get compiled. The compiler takes your program code and it goes to the first kind of character and it's a, or it goes to the first word and it says, "What's the word?" And let's say the word is int, right? Well, it creates, starts creating a tree like this with like int here and then it says main and main might be like one way or the other and it starts creating this interesting uh, uh, tree structure for your code and it's actually pretty cool. So if you ever take a compilers class you should you'll probably learn about that sort of stuff. Yeah. Uh, this is also how like social science is analyzed like especially with like Twitter data and stuff like that you can feed English sentences into trees and get like Right, you can right exactly you can feed you can this looks a little bit like those, you know, diagramming and things for English sentences, sure. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so we actually that's that's the last thing I wanted to show you today. Questions on trees. Yes. Luke. So if trees don't have that fragmentation problem that like lists have, right? Right? Or is there some other implementation where they don't trees still have the fragmentation yeah. problem? Oh, yeah. yes. They are node based, so they do absolutely have a fragmentation problem. Yeah. The benefits of using a tree with nodes is the speed of which you can get from the top to the bottom. So and that, that's logarithmic, which is very helpful. Yeah. Anybody else? Good question. All right. See you guys in lab or on Wednesday. <laughs>